Thanks for inviting me to speak today, and it's an honor to be presenting with two of the gurus of obstetric anesthesia. Uh, the only disclosure I have to make is that Brendan is my boss, so whatever he says goes. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is the use of multimodal analgesia and opioid reduction strategies in the cesarean delivery setting. The topics I'm going to cover today include the evidence behind the use of multimodal analgesia in the cesarean delivery setting, what is currently regarded in contemporary OB anesthesia practice as gold standard, gold, gold standard analgesia regimens. I'm going to touch on some of the emerging therapies that have been explored in the literature regarding other pharmacological options of reducing pain scores and reducing opioid consumption in the post-operative setting, including emerging truncal nerve blocks, which have been recently investigated. So as Brian mentioned, cesarean delivery is now one of the most commonly performed operations in the world. In 2016, in the US alone, there were 1.3 million of these procedures performed. Now, the importance of good analgesia for cesarean delivery is highlighted by the fact that avoidance of pain ranks as one of the highest priorities amongst women undergoing this procedure. In addition to this, for people or women who develop acute pain post-operatively, a subset of these women go on to develop persistent pain. And these are women that are more likely to use opioids, are more likely to have a poorer functional recovery, and are more likely to develop postpartum depression. So this is a real issue. In addition to this, women who develop post-operative pain are more likely to have an impairment in maternal and neonatal bonding and are less likely to have success when breastfeeding. This is a study that was undertaken at Stanford two years ago where 213 nulliparous women were called up on a daily basis following cesarean delivery and vaginal delivery. And you can see with the red line that even at 50 days postpartum, 10% of the women who had cesarean deliveries in this institution still had persistent pain. And once again, these are women that um, may not have necessarily had or needed opioids before, but once you are using pain, uh, once you're using opioids for pain after 50 days, you're more likely to carry on needing them longer term. And this has implications for future pregnancies and future deliveries because these are women that, if they are requiring opioids in subsequent pregnancies, have an increase in neonatal and maternal morbidity and mortality. Another reason to try and reduce our opioid prescription and consumption in our women postpartum is that out of all the analgesic drugs that we give in the postpartum period, opioids have the highest rates of breast milk transfer ratios and this has implications on the neonate because it predisposes them to sedation, respiratory depression, and if the mom stops taking these drugs abruptly, then the, the, the newborns can withdraw as well. I'm not going to go into too much uh, detail about multimodal analgesia, but this is a term that was first coined in the 1990s, and initially when it was first published, it was described as balanced analgesia. And simply put, this is a way of using different pharmaceutical or pharmacological strategies to attack different parts of the pain pathway. Now in OB anesthesia, we tend to use neuraxial anesthesia together with neuraxial opioids and acetaminophen and non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And over the next few slides, I'm going to talk about the evidence behind using these. So in current contemporary OB anesthesia practice, our gold standard regimen for, the, for analgesia is the com combination of neuraxial anesthesia, intrathecal morphine, and an opioid sparing analgesia regimen of round the clock acetaminophen and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. I'm gonna go through each of these in a bit more detail and the evidence behind them. Neuraxial anesthesia is known to be safer than general anesthesia. It's associated with a decrease in morbidity and mortality for the mom. And in addition to this, the other big benefits of using neuraxial anesthesia in the absence of contraindications is that it's the best kind of pain relief that we can provide for the mom in the postpartum period. And consequently, this has been endorsed by multiple societies, including the American Society of Anesthesiologists, American Pain Society, and obviously the SOAP Society as well. Next, moving on to the use of intrathecal opioids. This was a landmark systematic review published in 1999, which summarized all of the studies 
where, they, where women were administered either bupivacaine alone intrathecally or bupivacaine plus opioid intrathecally. And this included short-acting and long-acting opioids. And the primary outcome for this systematic review was to look at the incidence of requirements for intraoperative supplemental analgesia. And you can see here that with the addition of intrathecal opioid, the need for supplemental analgesia reduced from 24% to 4%. And the authors concluded that this was with a number needed to treat of only five women. So if we know that intrathecal opioids are a good thing in this population, then the decision needs to be taken next as to what intrathecal opioids should be used. Should we use a shorter-acting lipophilic agent such as fentanyl or a longer-acting hydrophilic agent such as morphine? And in the same systematic review, the, the authors looked at the time till first analge analgesic supplementation as a, a surrogate marker for the effect or timing or duration of intrathecal fentanyl and opioid uh, and morphine and the durations were found to be four hours and 27 hours with fentanyl and morphine respectively. So we can conclude here that morphine is probably a better option in the cesarean delivery population. Moving on from this, if we are going to use intrathecal morphine, then we need to decide what dose we should use. Now this is a systematic review and meta-analysis that we published a couple of years ago where we divided contemporary doses into either low dose, which is 50 to 100 micrograms of intrathecal morphine, versus higher doses of greater than 100 to 250 micrograms of intrathecal morphine. And what we found was when we looked at the duration of analgesia over time till first analgesic request, there was about a four and a half hour increase with the use of higher doses. However, this was at the expense of an increase in incidence of opioid-related side effects, including nausea and vomiting and pruritus. So clearly there's a balance to be gained here between the use of higher doses, because on the one hand you may improve analgesia, but on the other hand you may actually increase your opioid-related side effects. So the current recommendation is to use somewhere between 100 and 200 micrograms. We tend to use 150 because I think it provides a good um, compromise. But having said that, though, this maybe should be tailored according to the, the woman that is in front of you. So tailored analgesic therapy is definitely recommended. The last thing in our gold standard analgesia regimen is the use of opioid sparing analgesia regimens. And that includes the round the clock use of acetaminophen and non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs together. Now the opioid epidemic or the opioid crisis has been very well publicized in North America. There are about 300 tweets just yesterday about this topic. So it's a real public health issue which is in the public eye. As Brian alluded to before, his study actually determined that one in 300 opioid naive women become persistent users of opioids after cesarean delivery. And the combined use of acetaminophen and non-steroidals as opposed to unimodal analgesic approaches have been associated with providing superior pain relief and reducing the need for supplemental opioids. Now the evidence behind the use of acetaminophen in the cesarean delivery setting can be shown by this retrospective impact study undertaken at Stanford a couple of years ago. And this actually was a study where they introduced a change of practice. So originally all women used to get a as required regimen of acetaminophen oxycodone postpartum, whereas after implementing a change, this was changed to scheduled acetaminophen with PRN or as required oxycodone. And just by doing this simple change, there was a significant increase in time to first opioid usage. So from this, we should conclude that we should use regular acetaminophen. And we probably should also avoid the use of combined acetaminophen opioid drugs, because this can also lead to inadvertent overdose of acetaminophen, and also may potentially even result in unnecessary or unrequired opioid administration. The evidence behind the use of non steroidals has been very well documented in the literature in the obstetric setting. This is a meta-analysis of 22 randomized control trials with over 1,300 patients. And what you can see from these forest plots is that there is a significant reduction in 12 and 24 hour visual analog pain scores and a significant reduction in opioid consumption with the use of non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs. So, this is something we should be giving all of our patients in the absence of contraindications in the postpartum period. <laughs> 
The evidence behind the combined use of acetaminophen and non is lacking in the obstetric literature. However, the evidence is very, very strong in the non-obstetric literature. And this is a summary of 21 randomized controlled trials in a systematic review of nearly 1,900 patients. And this study showed that using a combination of acetaminophen and non anti-inflammatory drugs was more effective than acetaminophen alone in 85% of the studies. And the combination was also more effective than non alone in 64% of the studies. So in terms of risks versus benefits, there's not much reason due to the, the low adverse effect profile and side effect profile of these drugs to be giving these to our women following cesarean delivery. And if at all possible, we should be administering these drugs orally in the postpartum period to encourage the enhanced recovery of these women to try and get IV lines out to and try and encourage oral intake and feeding and eating um, and getting the women back to normality and getting them discharged home as soon as possible. Now, the next part of my talk, I'm going to talk about some of the other emerging strategies and therapies that have been used in an attempt to improve pain and reduce opioid consumption in the post-cesarean delivery setting. First of all, the use of dexamethasone. Now, the, there is compelling evidence in the non-obstetric literature that dexamethasone improves pain scores and reduces opioid consumption. And this is a summary of 45 randomized control trials in nearly 6,000 patients. Granted, these are, um, these are not cesarean deliveries, and these are patients that have had general anesthesia. But these studies compared uh, the use of 1 to, 2, 1 to 20 milligrams of dexamethasone versus placebo. And you can see here that the 24-hour pain scores with the use of dexamethasone was significantly improved, and also 24-hour opioid consumption was significantly improved. Now, there's been a couple of studies that have been using dexamethasone and evaluating their use in terms of opioid consumption in the OB setting. The first one is a randomized controlled trial of 52 women with the concomitant use of a multimodal analgesia strategy, including intrathecal morphine, and the women were either given 8 milligrams of dexamethasone or placebo. And you can see here that the pain, the post-operative opioid consumption at 24 hours was no different between the groups. However, pain scores were slightly lower at 12 hours, but not different at 6 and 24 hours. So the evidence seems to be less compelling in this study. In another study with 70 women randomized to either receive 10 milligrams of dexamethasone or placebo in the cesarean delivery setting with spinal anesthesia and a multimodal analgesia regimen, these authors actually looked at the numbers of women who had pain scores of greater than 3 out of 10, and there was a significant decrease in numbers of these women at 1 hours, 6 hours, 12 hours, and 24 hours postpartum. So there is some evidence. It's not as good as in the general anesthesia non-OB literature. Um, however, there are many centers that are adopting the use of dexamethasone as part of their enhanced recovery protocols. Um, another potential advantage is to improve nausea and vomiting rates. And um, there should be some caution exercise, particularly with women who have glucose intolerance or um, evidence of diabetes. Moving on to the next pharmacological option, which has been studied greatly in the non-OB population, and this is the use of gabapentin. So in the non-OB literature, there were 16 randomized controlled trials that were evaluated, which showed that with the use of gabapentin perioperatively, there was a decrease in pain scores and also a decrease in 24-hour op opioid consumption as well. Now, probably the best randomized controlled trial to date is coming from Toronto, where nearly 200 women were either given a perioperative course of gabapentin or a placebo in the multimodal regimen including cesarean, uh, including intrathecal morphine. And this study showed that there was a statistically significant improvement in 24-hour pain scores. Um, however, these are not clinically significant. There was no difference in 48-hour pain scores and no difference in 24 or 48-hour opioid consumption. So based on current available evidence, there's not enough evidence to suggest that we should be using this routinely and also, I should note that there is a, um, a concern regarding the rates of high breast milk transfer, which remain a concern. So further 
studies are needed to evaluate the maternal and neonatal safety of gabapentin in the cesarean delivery setting. However, there may be a role for gabapentin in patients who have chronic pain or in patients who can't have intrathecal morphine for whatever reason, and also for women who, even despite having our gold standard analgesia regimen, still have breakthrough pain. Moving on to another drug, which has been extensively explored in the OB setting, and this is the use of ketamine. Now, this is a meta-analysis of obstetric anesthesia trials in the cesarean delivery setting, 12 randomized control trials, seven of which were regional anesthesia studies, five of which were general anesthesia studies, and the use of either IV or intrathecal ketamine, most of them were intravenous, given around the time of cesarean delivery, was associated with an increased time to analgesic request, a decrease in 24-hour opioid consumption, and a decrease in two-hour resting visual analog scale scores of pain. Since this meta-analysis, there have been four further randomized controlled trials published. There was one which was a general anesthesia study, one which used intrathecal ketamine, and all of them have shown differences in um, the use of ketamine versus not. There was a significant increase in time to first supplemental analgesia in two studies, a decrease in pain at 24 hours in three studies, and a decrease in morphine consumption in one study. So there's definitely good evidence that ketamine does help with pain outcomes and does reduce opioid consumption. However, whether we want to be giving this routinely to our women and inducing side effects such as hallucinations and sedation is something that needs to be carefully considered. And I would suggest that we should only reserve this for patients who are chronic pain patients or potentially um, are not having success with our standard regimens. Moving on to another drug which has gained some popularity and is being used routinely in some centers but not in the majority of places is clonidine. And I, before I go any further, I do want to mention that there is a FDA black box warning against the routine use of neuraxial clonidine, mainly due to the side effects of hypotension, bradycardia, and sedation. Um, having said that though, there is appreciation that there that there are certain situations where the benefits may outweigh the risks of the use of clonidine. And this is a meta-analysis of 18 different studies looking at the use of neuraxial clonidine. And there was a significant improvement in um, opioid consumption, which the label has gone off the top of the first forest plot, and also an increase in time to first analgesic use. So there's, this is very good evidence, but I think, once again, we need to weigh the risks versus benefits of using clonidine in, in these particular situations and bearing in mind that there are some potential for side effects here. Moving on to the last part of my talk, I'm going to cover four of the explored truncal blocks and field blocks that have been extensively researched in the field of obstetric anesthesia. First of all, the use of transversus abdominis plane blocks. Um, if you compare intrathecal morphine versus TAP blocks, then intrathecal morphine is associated with better pain outcomes in the postpartum period. Therefore, we should, where possible, use intrathecal morphine. Having said that, there are often pa patients that we come across that need to have general anesthesia for whatever reason, whether it's due to contraindications or due to the urgency of surgery. And for these women, TAP blocks are definitely a good idea. Um, there is evidence that it is associated with an improvement in pain scores when compared with um, a control or a placebo. Um, so if we are going to use TAP blocks, then what dosing strategy should we use? Last year, we published a meta-analysis in the BJA where we compared low doses versus high doses of TAP blocks, and our cutoff was 50 milligrams of bupivacaine equivalents per side of the TAP block, and this was chosen just because it's what most places use of 20 mils of 0.25% bupivacaine. And what we found was that actually when we compare high dose to the low dose TAP blocks, both were effective against placebo, but in direct comparison in a subgroup analysis, there was no difference in any of the pain outcomes between high dose and low dose. And we must take into account the fact that our pregnant women are at a higher risk of local anesthetic systemic toxicity. So based on current available evidence, we recommend that no more than 20 mils of 0.25% bupivacaine should be administered per side when performing tap blocks. Now, the next thing I'm going to talk about is the new kid on the block, and that is the use of quadratus lumborum blocks. This is a block which aims to deposit local anesthetic between the quadratus lumborum and the psoas muscle. 
And this can be done in three different approaches, which are termed the QLB 1, 2, and 3. And recently, there's been a change in nomenclature to lateral, posterior, and anterior, according to where the needle tip position ends up anatomically. The theoretical advantage of using a QLB 3 block is that there's a greater amount of paravertebral spread, a greater amount of cranial spread, which results in improved analgesia and therefore a decreased incidence, theoretically, of motor block as well. There have been four randomized controlled trials in the obstetric anesthesia literature to date. The first three compare QLB1 and 2 um, to placebo in the setting of short-acting intrathecal opioids, and these first three show an improvement in opioid consumption up to 23 hours. But I think the most interesting out of all of these is a study which is hot off the press, which is undertaken in Korea, where they actually directly compared QLB3, or the anterior approach, to intrathecal morphine, and interestingly found that there were significant improvements in pain scores and opioid consumption. Now, I'm not saying we should be throwing away our intrathecal morphine just yet, but this is definitely food for thought. This needs further study in order to corroborate with this, whether this is a reproducible finding, but certainly this may be something to consider in the future, and potentially if this does become a, uh, a block that's used further in the future, then this may potentially be used in conjunction with lower doses of intrathecal morphine, but watch this space. The next thing I'm going to talk about is the use of ileo-inguinal and ileo-hypogastric blocks. These are combined blocks which cover the L1 dermatome where the fan and steel incision lies. Like all of these truncal nerve blocks, they tend to be better for somatic rather than visceral pain. And once again, these blocks are something to consider when a woman can't have intrathecal morphine for whatever reason. Now, there have been three randomized controlled trials that have looked at the use of combined ILIH blocks in conjunction with a multimodal analgesia strategy. And there were two studies that have used the ILIH blocks in conjunction with intrathecal morphine, and the results have been conflicting in terms of effects on pain score. So further research and studies are needed to evaluate the efficacy of these blocks, and also the efficacy of combining ILIH blocks and TAP blocks, for example. There's one study that's done that, which has shown that it potentially could have a role um, in terms of improving opioid consumption, even compared to intrathecal morphine. So there's lots of areas of research still needed here. The last thing that I'm going to talk about is the use of wound infiltration. Now, this is something simple that we can ask our OB and uh, OB surgical colleagues to do, as there's no need for ultrasound requirements and there's no stress on the anesthesiologist part. So this is a summary of 21 randomized controlled trials in the elective cesarean delivery setting in over 1,400 patients. The authors concluded that there was a very high degree of heterogeneity among the studies included, but based on the current available evidence, if we're going to be using wound infiltration, it's probably more efficacious in the setting where intrathecal morphine can't be used. If we can, it's probably better to be used in conjunction with a catheter technique and the catheter should be located below the fascia to improve analgesia as well. So to summarize my talk, current, in current obstetric anesthesia practice, the gold standard is regarded to be the use of neuraxial anesthesia with a long-acting intrathecal opioid, such as preservative-free morphine, in conjunction with regular acetaminophen and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. There is a role for regional anesthesia blocks either to supplement intrathecal morphine or in the absence of intrathecal morphine. And further research is needed to determine what the optimum block is in terms of truncal nerve block, what the optimum combination of blocks is, and when best to use catheters. There are other emerging nerve blocks, such as the erectus spiny block, and also the use of intraperitoneal infiltration, which are gaining more and more studies, and, and there's lots of studies which are pending on the clinicaltrials.gov website. For example, there's, there's about 10 different QLB studies which we're still waiting for the results on. Also, there's studies being registered for the use of liposomal bupivacaine and the use of this in all these different types of blocks. And finally, we still don't know what the optimum drug and dose and volume of, and concentrations are of these different blocks. I'm just going to finish with a plug for the SOAP meeting next year, but thank you for your time.